Dior, welcome back to the spotlight. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for having me. Hey, thanks for being here. And we are seeing right now out in the global economy, we're noticing that things are starting to slow down a little bit. China right now is saying that they're going to be cutting back on their growth estimates. When you look at the global economy, are you saying that the the global economy is actually slowing or do you think everything is still fine? Um, Global trade right now is, is peaked about a year and a half ago. And that's a very important, uh, you know, component. I, I call it peak globalization because uh, what's going on right now is that countries are becoming more nationalistic. They're putting more, you know, protections on, on their borders uh, and, and tariffs. Importing and exporting is becoming harder. That's exactly what uh, Trump is, is trying to do. Keep the jobs home, not export the jobs out and, uh, you know, renegotiate all of these trading deals. And every time that has happened in the 20th century and now in the 21st century, especially for the U.S., there is a 100 percent recession within 12 months. That's 13 out of 13 times that it happened uh, where global trade has peaked for a few years. There was a recession exactly one well, well within a year of it, especially on inauguration year when there's a new president coming on there's so much uncertainty and you got to think all of these companies that are uh, multinational they're they don't know what's going on there might be new laws coming in so they don't know whether to hire uh, and expand or to fire so they're halting everything and that's why global trade is diminishing um and that's an that's an important question and, and i'm glad you asked it because the bottom line of this is that it, it, this is very uh, deflationary for the entire global economy, which means you're going to see pockets of inflation national uh, in, in on a national level. Meaning, for instance, the U.S. has been the exporter of one commodity for the past 46 years. It's called the U.S. dollar. It's been exporting it and importing tangible goods. That's that, that's the game, and now they're they're they can't do it anymore. So, well, they're going to do it to a lesser extent, and and what you're going to see is these dollars that have been, uh, you know, <laughs> handled by foreign countries for 46 years. You're going to see them start flooding back into the United States banking system, and that's very inflationary, and you can't export them out uh, again because the countries don't want them. They want to be more nationalistic. That's an important thing, and that might make inflation uh, higher. Right now, inflation is at 2.5%. And it, it the last three months, it's gone up month over month at record pace, uh, almost 0.6% in January, which is huge. And uh, it, it, this is becoming a problem. It's becoming a huge problem. You, you mentioned dollars coming back to the U.S. because of what is happening with the global economy. As these dollars come back to the U.S., are they going to be placed into the U.S. economy where we're going to see more dollars in the economy? Is, is that what you're saying? Is that why we're going to see the devaluation? Actually, inflation is the devaluation of the dollar. Is that why we're going to see more inflation coming? First of all, China and Japan are both basically playing with, with the U.S. economy as much as they want because they're the largest creditors. So, you know, nobody talks about this, Dave, but if, if China buys a 30-year bond or a two-year bond, that's an important thing to know. And they're dumping their long-term 30-year bonds. They're then switching to two-year bonds. They're basically controlling the flows of money much, uh, much more because they're t- telling the U.S., uh, the U.S. government, look, we're willing to borrow for two years, to loan you money for two years now, not for 30. We're, we're, we're playing with you. They, uh, the U.S. economy is becoming a slave to these creditors, uh, especially to China and Japan. And, w- and they're starting to dump, to sell, because they want to make their own currencies, especially China, make their currencies uh, stabler, much, much more stable. That's why they're buying a lot of, uh, of gold in China and, and in Russia. They're trying to ally and make their uh, currencies more relevant for global trade than the U.S. dollar. Now, when those, uh, when those funds come to the U.S., they go into the commercial banks. When the commercial banks get them, um, you, you got to realize if the, if, the, if the interest rates are low, the banks have no reason 
to loan them out. They're not in a, in a rush. They have excess cash. And that's what's going on with the large banks today in the U.S. system. They have excess reserves that are at record highs. They're starting to give money back to, to, to the Federal Reserve, it, this, you know, extinguish these these funds, these access um, funds, because uh, this is detrimental to their to their uh, uh, business model. That's why the Fed is raising the rates right now, because they want the banks to start lending so that, you know, uh, inflation would pick up in the economy. People will start borrowing again, spending again. Things will move like they want. These banks, they live off of debt. They want the entire economy to be in, you know, to owe them. And for the past few years, uh, only car- corporations have been borrowing money. And, <clears throat> you know, when you can borrow money at such cheap rates, what companies have done in the stock market, especially these broad, uh, you know, these broad indices like the S&P 500, the Dow and the NASDAQ, they've been buying their own shares back. So when companies buy their own shares back, you see all of these great profits. But these are synthetic profits, right? Because th- th- these are not generated by actual company, uh, uh, you know, companies becoming better. It's generated because they borrow funds at zero rates and they bought their own shares back from the public. And now it looks like every share has more profit on it. This is unsustainable. This has caused the, the S&P 500 to be at a P.E. ratio of 27 today. That has not been uh, as high only in the dot-com bubble. And I'm going back to the 1890s. I'm going back 130 years. It has not been this high. It, it would now take you 27 years if, if uh, you want to buy a, a, the S&P 500 and make all of it a private company. The, the, the price you pay for it would take you 27 years of profit to get back your money. That's, an, that's a very... Uh, lousy investment. The the broad stock markets are very very expensive. Anyways, the corporations will not be able to to keep borrowing when the Fed raises rate, raises rates. But the millennials that are feeling much more comfortable right now with the Trump in in in, uh, in office, they might start lending again for starting up businesses for. Um, getting into uh, to to uh, to the first homes, you know, taking on their first mortgages. They're starting to you know to forget about 2008, and that's scary. That's that that is to me the scariest part of this. It looks like uh, you know people have forgotten that nothing has changed, nothing fundamentally has changed. Uh, you know, if you listen to all of these congressional debates in 2008 and all of the things that they asked the banks to change, to simplify their models, to not have 3,000, 4,000 subsidiaries and LLCs and offshore accounts, nothing has been done. And so it's very scary to know that an entire generation is starting to forget about this, feel more comfortable, they're gonna borrow again, and this all starts to feel very familiar at at the worst time because, um, you know, for for like eight years, these people have been scared of the of the stock market, and they've not been suckered into it uh, to play with with the companies that they know nothing about. And now it seems like they're feeling much more comfortable. This is it's it's a scary it's a scary time. So you mentioned the stock market with uh, individuals feeling hope. They're feeling, you know, like things are getting better. And lately what we've been seeing is that companies, like you said, they're they're not buying as much of their own stock anymore. That's slowing up right now. We also see the smart money in the market. They are selling their shares and they're selling it to retailers. Is this a classic bubble type of situation? Do, do you see a classic bubble happening in the market? Not yet. And that's the scary part. There's so much cash sitting on the sidelines that have that has not participated in this rally that we had in the last eight years. It's mostly been institutional money, and it's mostly been hedge funds. And here's here's the thing, Dave. In 1980, when the last bull market began, it took two and a half weeks for the average American worker to accumulate a salary and buy a share of the Dow. Today, it takes 27 weeks. The stock market, which you and I and the labor, toil, sweat, honesty, efforts of, of genuine Americans, 
uh, make these companies that that are the uh, you know the the backbone of the uh, the United States economy much uh, better. We can't participate. You know, they can't participate. The average worker cannot participate in the stock market. It will take them 27 weeks to buy one share of the Dow, 20,000. Um, and so the stock market is unattainable to the average worker. When he, when now when he feels that the economy is getting better, he might be tempted to get in there. There's a ton of cash sitting on the sideline. Again, I tell you, and this is the second longest bull market in history. It's now we're talking here. This is the 14th of March. This is eight years to the day the, the 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 market's bottom so this is by far the second longest bull market in history and we know the last one and how bad it ended uh at the dot-com bubble so it, it, it's it's a it's a very problematic time but no i don't think it's a bubble you you will be surprised what a bubble would look like in, in uh, I, I hope we won't see it, but uh, human nature is human nature. And don't be surprised to see everything moving up more and more and more without any regards to fundamentals. And there are no fundamentals in, anymore. And yeah, I, I, I do think the smart money is exiting or at least getting very cautious and very selective in what they do because they know that uh, right now it's it's euphoria everywhere. The Dow has just collected the, the, is its fastest thousand points in history. So the the move from nineteen to twenty thousand was the fastest one thousand move in history. Okay, oh, it's wow. a very it's a, yeah it's a very euphoric time. Um, the look, there's all kinds of stats that are insane since the elections. It's it's it looks like uh, the cork that was stuck uh, on this entire generation is now being unleashed and by the way that is very good for some investments like commodities uh, and that's why major banks have become bullish on zinc and cobalt and silver for the first time uh, in a long time you know in, in about six years and if you're talking about the big miners like bhp bulletin and rio tinto they're profitable for the first time in six years and their margins are better than tiffany's and, and retailers that, that would love to be as profitable as these larger miners so we're we're seeing a, a move into inflationary based investments right now and, and i think if you're smart this can be a very good time and and, I, and by the way um I, I wrote a few special reports for your listeners in case they want to know more about investing in commodities and they can go to wealthresearchgroup.com forward slash 2017 for my personal portfolio for this year no holds barred and they can also if, if they're you know if they want to allocate funds into safe havens and make sure that they're protected on the flip side they can go to wealthresearchgroup.com forward slash safe havens and it's a five. Uh, it, it's it's a very unique strategy on how to combine a few of the safe havens like gold, Bitcoin, a second passport, offshore real estate, and combine them into a very protective type of environment. If you, if that's what you're uh, worried about, the yeah, uh, give me those links and I'll put them at the bottom of the video. So anyone who is trying to write them down and stuff like that, they'll be at the bottom of the video. So this way, it's easy for you guys to. Uh, just click on them and bring you right over to where you need to go. No um, problem. I wanted to talk about, you mentioned silver, and I wanted to talk about silver and how silver was slammed down with about 23,000 paper contracts. Why do you think that happened? I think this was like last week this happened. Why do you think all of a sudden they need to? They needed to slam silver down? I think it's a very periodical thing now uh, for them. The, uh, the big banks are holding now the shortest uh, the 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 biggest short position in history in silver, and you know it's it's been going on for so many years. This uh, leveraged position on the flips uh, on the one side, and then they're they you know J.P. Morgan. What happened with them is that they they revealed that they are taking delivery on the futures market of the silver. So on one hand, they're shorting it. And they're making a ton of money from shorting it. They've never been wrong in a short position, Dave. You know that? For eight years, every time they've shorted, they got they made money. That's insane. That's very that's very rigged. That's 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 a very controlled yeah, market yeah. when when <laughs> when you can make money anytime. Um, and then on the flip side, they accumulate physical silver. 
they, they t- they're taking delivery on the COMEX. And, and by the way, they, they can see the, the back end of the, these systems. So they know what the traders are doing. I, I, you know, I've, I've, I've done a micro documentary on this on, on the Wealth Research Group uh, YouTube channel called Silver Fraud, and it goes into depth about this. It, silver is a very um, important position for, for some of these big banks, especially JP Morgan. And the reason is it's because silver is a monetary metal that has not been used for monetary uses uh, uh, by the big by the uh, by governments. Gold is held in reserves by almost any government on the planet, and by the EU, um, you know, it's 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 uh, it's out there. But silver is not, and that's a very important distinction. Now, why are they doing it? It could be a number of reasons, but bottom line, they're doing it to to make a lot of money. So uh, the the thing about it is, uh, th- what happens with what happened with silver? There were so many stockpiles during the 70s and 80s and 90s because these governments didn't need silver anymore. They dumped it into the open market, okay? And then in the year 2000, these stockpiles ended. So right now we're approaching a point where there's there's a real danger of a short uh, uh, supply of silver for the first time in about 45 years. A genuine problem in the supply of silver, and that's very that's a very that's the first time it has happened since this bull market uh, began in uh, in the year 2000. So look for silver to be very explosive. Uh, these these sh- rigged short positions can only last that long, and right now there's a genuine uh, supply shortage. So if 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 big traders start to take delivery. On the on the on the Comax, that that thing is leveraged about two hundred and fifty to one. It's 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 a huge problem. So when you say explosive, do do you think silver is going to shoot up to like what? I mean, you're talking like what is it like eighteen, nineteen right now? Uh, do you think where do you think it's going to go? Easily towards the twenty five, twenty nine dollars per per ounce uh, in in twenty seventeen. And by the way, if that happens. And it could happen. Silver has has, uh, has made a move in February and January. It went up for 11 straight weeks. It hasn't done that since 2006. And in 2006, it went up 58%. If you take 58% from today's values, it goes to about $29 per ounce. Um, if and and you know if that happens, I I think the gold silver ratio would would be around 60 to one. So figure gold about eight. 18- Fifteen hundred that at that point, um, if that happens, it's it's a very it's it's a very very big if. But the explosiveness is there, and I think the the most uh, incredible way to play this, if you're really looking to make a lot of money, is the silver miners because they've been very frugal, very very conservative, and a lot of them have a all-in cost of about five, six, ten dollars. So a move to Thirty dollars would make their bottom lines insane, especially when their biggest expense is oil, and oil has not been explosive at all. So, and labor costs, which have, which have not gone up uh, uh, for for decades. So, uh, that's a very important distinction. We, we will on on wealth research. We will profile two silver companies in the next two months that we've done a lot of research on going back to 2016 and you know, it's it's a major opportunity no doubt so what about bitcoin i mean bitcoin right now we see that surging quite a bit uh we know this is not regulated by the government as of yet it's not regulated by the central bank as of yet and we see that you know people in china here in the united states and around the world people are purchasing bitcoin why do you think everyone is moving towards bitcoin right now um, first of all, I, I want to tell you something. Bitcoin has started as as somewhat of a you know of a, you know a fringe movement, and uh, some some people that that accumulate gold have, have gone into Bitcoin, obviously because it's it's another form of protection. It's private. It's anonymous. Um, it, it's got a lot of characteristics that, that make it a safe haven. It's it's obviously not tangible, which which is a problem. It's depending and on the on the web, etc. We we know the disadvantages of it, but what, what I think is important is it, it's going mainstream. What 
what gold has not been able to do right uh, up until now is make uh, is going mainstream. There's only a 0.85% of the population, so less than 1% of the population own gold. And it, it, it's 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 stupid, it's foolish, obviously. Everyone should own about 5 to 10% of their savings in in gold at least. Why own uh, you know, why have everything you own in fiat currencies? It's it's uh it's not a smart move. But um Bitcoin has gone mainstream. If you just Google Bitcoin, you'll see people that, that are that are cutting edge scientists and, and entrepreneurs, including Bill Gates, talking about Bitcoin being the future of financial technology. Uh, we all know the the advantages personally, right, on an individual level, uh, on an individual level. But to the global commerce, it's insane. It it wipes out about 500 billion dollars of of notes that are counterfeited every year you know that the the united states and the cia has to counterfeit uh, has to counterfeit, has to collect about 500 billion dollars worth of counterfeit notes just us dollars yearly um, it, it takes 3 to 4 days to get stuff to get the money moved around the world you got all these middlemen and bitcoin eliminates all that so from a financial perspective, it, it, it's quite amazing. Now, the blockchain itself, that technology is, is very important, especially for third world countries. Remember, these dictatorships, they can see, they seize land like every other day. Now, what they're doing in third world countries is they're using the blockchain. This is a blessed, uh, a blessed thing, uh, Dave. They put their land, their, their title, on the blockchain and now you can never seize it from them it's owned it's there it's you know you can never do anything about it it's changing the way people uh live their lives from first world to second world to third world countries and you know the future of it is is, is very uh is very promising for all of these uh digital currencies it the thing about it it's hard to pinpoint their intrinsic value right because it's not like a metal it doesn't take effort to mine it the same way a, a gold bar would take effort you can calculate how much labor went into it so the intrinsic value of the bitcoin is is a derivative of how much fear there is in the market how much people value privacy how much people value a lot of things that's, that's what that's what gives it uh, its its value and it does have uh, it does does have value. Um, I, I got to tell you, I was I, I was first alerted to Bitcoin when it was three dollars per coin. So I, I've been following the story for a long time. Do you think um, the, the central banks they want to gain control of the cryptocurrency, uh, Bitcoin? Do you think they want control of it? Huh. Um, I think central bankers want control of everything. <laughs> that's the, the, that's their that's their nature. That's the nature of the beast. But I, but uh, you know, I don't think they, I don't think they can possibly do it. Here, here's the thing: a central bank can only exist when the population is unaware of it, and it can only be created when the population is experiencing a crisis mode. So, in 1908, when about I think like three or four hundred banks failed only in New York, they sent this guy to Europe to, to see how the model in Europe is. He came back with the, with these ideas about central banking and the, the guy's name was Nelson Holdrick. He was married to one of these uh, families, either the Rothschilds or you know the, the Rockefellers. I can't remember the details. Or, um, but, but anyways, when they formed the Federal Reserve, it was in a time where the entire United States banking system was in need of of some change, some some new ideas. It actually took him two years to formulate a plan, etc. The 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 United States um, uh, population is not ready for a change right now. They were ready for a change in 2008, and unfortunately, uh, they didn't get the this you know the, this uh, new system that would have been much better than what, what's going on right now. So uh, hopefully. Uh, Bitcoin is a step in the right direction. I, I I would love to see the the population 
situation of, of many of these countries, such as Europe, such as going on right now in France, for instance, where they are going to probably elect uh, Le Pen and then might exit the euro. The, the euro might collapse because of it, uh, um, and no doubt, if, if, you know, if, if the Brits and uh, the, France, uh, the French go out to get her out of the euro. Um, so they might want control over it, but uh, I, I don't think this is something that's, uh, that's probable for them. It would take, it would take a, a huge, huge event Say like a you know like a it would take a huge event. I don't I don't want to say a 9/11 right, but uh, it would take a huge event for for the people to agree that the government steps in and and do something about Bitcoin. People will absolutely go berserk if that happens. Now you mentioned uh, that back in 2008, uh, the population was ready for a new system. And and when you say like something new, like what are you talking about? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Sure. You said something about where. Back in 2008, the people were ready for a new system at that time, something different, but it didn't happen. The central bank, they kept everything going. What do you mean by something new, like a new currency, a new uh, getting rid of the central bank? What did you mean by that? Well, obviously, Dave, anytime there's a there's a crisis, then people are doing, you know, soul searching and, and uh, an entire nation is doing soul searching. What have we done wrong? What's the problem what can we do better and unfortunately uh the 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 either the people weren't aggressive enough uh the, you know i'm not talking about people who listen to this show people who listen to this show want change immediately but most people are 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 not uh, you know uh, x22 spotlight listeners unfortunately and they're too you know glued to their, their mainstream media uh that tells them you know anything and everything that the the corporate masters want them, uh, uh, you know, want to feed them. So in 2008, there was a real chance that uh, uh, you know either a, a, a currency that's backed by a tangible asset, something that is much more reasonable than what's going on right now. The dollar and all of these currencies are are are, are such scams that it's it's uh, the only thing that gives the dollar or any currency any value is the fact that they're fiat um, uh, uh, fiat currencies that are law you have to accept them that's what gives them value in the first place and then you know when when the united states issues bonds what gives those bonds value it's it's the it's the fact that they can they can collect taxes if they can't collect uh, collect income from taxes these, these notes mean nothing they're they're absolutely um, without uh, without any collateral, um, and you got to think about that. Google has more cash than the entire United States government. Apple has a few times more cash than the United States government. United States government is burning four thousand dollars per second, wow. and that is insane. They have seventy-five million dollars, uh, seventy-five billion dollars a month that they're burning, and they only have two hundred billion uh, in cash. By June first, this is coming to a, to a screeching halt, and they have to decide what to do again. Now, obviously, if I was the president, uh, and I'm, I'm thinking like a president here, I don't want to I don't want to rock the boat. So uh, he would want to raise the the debt ceiling again. Obviously, he, he wouldn't want to do it on a personal level, on a conscious uh, his conscious would would fight him on this. But, but uh, all of these creditors, you, the United States can't afford to. To renege on its obligations, so obviously they will use their magic wand of of, uh, of the Federal Reserve System, and they would keep. Uh, there was, I think, they would raise the the debt ceiling again. But with Washington being so polarized, like it's never been before, and these establishment people uh, from the right and the left, from the Democrats and Republicans, they hate Trump. They they don't like this this populist movement. I would bet you. That they would use this crisis, squeeze everything out of that uh, debt ceiling um, to try and even overthrow him. And if they can't do it because the the, the public loves him too much and they feel uh, too comfortable with him, they will do something to make him uh, appear very, very irresponsible. Um, and remember, this all comes due June 1st. June 1st, the United States government is basically out of money. 
So you're, what you're saying here is that you think they're going to use this debt ceiling crisis to their advantage. That there is talk now, and I think Julian Assange came out and said there is a movement within a certain faction to actually try to force Trump out. And and it's been noticeable. I mean, it's it, it's not like, oh, this is a surprise. But we can see that, you know, there are some individuals calling for impeachment. There is other people saying that he's, you know, working with Russia. And with his debt ceiling coming up, it looks like this might be a perfect opportunity to actually squeeze him, like you said. If, if they do raise the debt ceiling, doesn't this just kick the can down the street and make things makes everything a lot worse um well obviously on the long on a long long term basis yes on the short term the market will rally because this means more inflation is coming and the infrastructure plan is is green light middle class america will start spending more um you'll see all of these industrial metals like uh like zinc and uh you know cobalt is is a metal that goes into to uh to the batteries of these electric cars that are going to rule the streets of of uh uh, of the of the United States and Asia in about 20 30 years and and uh, this is a, a big big move zinc is going to be an important metal uh, going forward you know we're talking about the United States infrastructure plan that he promised would be a trillion dollars it's now almost 4 trillion dollars uh, that's what they're debating so just think of of the level of uh, of infrastructure that the, the United States needs they can't possibly do that while they want to cut taxes on on the flip side that's an impossibility um and so uh, uh, the market will start seeing that trump um is going forward with his plans but it's not the way that he promised it's not going to be um all all uh, white roses it's, it's a problem and what what no one's talking about they've is that in asia their, their infrastructure plan is 20 six trillion dollars to build these mega cities these mega bridges all of these train systems that are trying to connect in uh, china is going to connect in the entire continent of asia with a railway system they're going to go until the stance until you know kazakhstan and all these countries they're going to have a railway system going there you got to realize there's there's a billion and a half people there they're building cities that are 50 million people and the pollution there is insane it's impossible so they need to move to these uh, electric cars uh, as well. They need to build uh, in, in a different way. It's urbanization at its uh, at its most powerful uh, stage. And uh, you know, if the debt ceiling rises, that will mean that the infrastructure plan is going ahead, and it will mean inflation. The the Fed will probably raise rates to try to tame inflation. Um, I don't know how successful that would be. I think it's it's impossible for one bank to stop a global inflation because it's not going to be just in the U.S. Um, and so there's a lot of things coming down the pike that are, that are uh, changing uh, what, what we saw in the last eight years. Lior, do, do you think, I mean, let's say they do raise the debt ceiling and he does get the trillion or three trillion. I mean, does it really matter at this point? <laughs> I mean, it, they're just going to keep borrowing. I mean, that's really what's going to happen. And the, and the Fed starts to raise interest rates. Do you think the central bank, like you said, they're going to kind of lose control as we move forward? How is this all going to end, though? I mean, yes, the market will go up. But what about the real economy? What about, you know, um, people who are, you know, buying food, people who are out there, you know, trying to make a living if we see inflation? Because we're seeing salaries head, uh, they're, they're, they're declining right now. Will, in, will salaries move up? Will everything move up all at once? Well, sa salaries are a derivative of profits. When a business makes a, makes a profit, then it needs to compete for employees with other businesses. And so salaries rise and, and people are are uh, are valued more for their for their skills. So if if uh, if businesses thrive in America, then yes. If businesses don't thrive, then no, wages will not go up, um, sa saving rates will not go up, etc. So to answer your 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 question, I think the lower part of the social uh, economic class, the poor, will stay poor. They will not enjoy this move up. They they can't basically. Uh, the middle class America will probably have uh, a move into real estate again. 
Yeah, because if you're if you're 28 or 30 or 35 and you've got a stable job, you're 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 you're, you're starting to feel good about the economy. And they're telling you, look, uh, this is what the bankers will do. Obviously, they will call these people and they will tell them, look, we're raising rates. Rates are going to rise. You, you either take your home now or you're going to pay much, much more in the future. What would you do? You have this dream of buying a house. Your wife is wanting you to buy the house. You want to move into a better neighborhood. You're you're now renting, right? People are going to get tempted to take real estate out again, take mortgages out again. It's a, it's a guarantee. Banks will want to lend more because they will gain more in, in interest so you might see a lot of money flowing into the mortgage market again and it, it's exactly what you don't want it's 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 the cycle beginning all over again this endless debt cycle that i wish everyone would just get out of and but uh, it's it's hopeless lior thank you very much for being on the x22 report spotlight uh once again how can people see your work well wealthresearchgroup.com forward slash well just go to the website and here's here's what you do if you're there for the first time on the top menu the the the, the two left buttons are called wealth stocks and special reports and the special reports are a rich plethora of information if you're a novice investor if and, and if you're an advanced investor and to the to the left of it the the wealth stocks are companies that that i think will go up and be profitable and be become one of your uh, uh, you know your dynasty your legacy type companies that you can always trust will make uh, more money because they got great management teams and for a 20 30 40 year time frame you will be, become richer and richer and wealthier by these companies that have historically uh, gone up about 11 12 uh, percent per year and you know compare that to the s p with about seven percent so that's 50 percent higher you're, you're talking hedge fund money here and with a lot less risk than most people take so these are two things that i think uh you, your listeners would would uh would appreciate and obviously um you you you're more than welcome to put those uh those uh, um urls that i mentioned before on the description and people can definitely go there and take, take out these special reports lior thank you very much thank you for being on the uh x22 report spotlight i really appreciate it thank you thank you for having me honest the efforts of of genuine americans uh, make these companies that that are the uh, you know the the backbone of the uh, the united states economy much uh, better we can't participate you know they can't participate the average worker cannot participate in the stock market it will take them 27 weeks to buy one share of the dow at 20000 um and so the stock market is unattainable to the average worker when he, when now when he feels that the economy is getting better he might be tempted to get in there. There's a ton of cash sitting on the sideline. Again, I tell you, and this is the second longest bull market in history. It's now we're talking here. This is the 14th of March. This is eight years to the day the the the, the market's bottom. So this is by far the second longest bull market in history, and we know the last one and how bad it ended uh, at the dot com bubble. So. It's it's a it's a very problematic time, but no, I don't think it's a bubble. You you will be surprised what a bubble would look like. In I I hope we won't see it, but uh, human nature is human nature, and don't be surprised to see everything moving up more and more and more without any regards to fundamentals, and there are no fundamentals anymore. And yeah, I I, I do think the smart money is exiting or at least getting very cautious. And very selective in what they do because they know that uh, right now it's it's euphoria everywhere. The Dow has just collected the, the is its fastest thousand points in history. So the the move from nineteen to twenty thousand was the fastest one thousand move in history. Okay, oh, it's wow. a very it's a, yeah it's a very euphoric time. Um, the look there's all kinds of stats that are insane since the elections. It's it's it looks like. Uh, the cork that was stuck uh, on this entire generation is now being unleashed. And by the way, that is very good for some investments like commodities. Uh, and that's why major banks have become bullish on zinc and cobalt and silver for the first time 
uh, in a long time, you know, in, in about six years. And if you're talking about the big miners like BHP, Bulletin, and Rio Tinto, they're profitable for the first time in six years. You are welcome back to the spotlight. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for having me. Hey, thanks for being here. And we are seeing right now out in the global economy, we're noticing that things are starting to slow down a little bit. China right now is saying that they're going to be cutting back on their growth estimates. When you look at the global economy, are you seeing that the the global economy is actually slowing or do you think everything is still fine? Um, global trade right now is, is peaked about a year and a half ago. And that's a very important, uh, you know, component. I, I call it peak globalization because uh, what's going on right now is that countries are becoming more nationalistic. They're putting more, you know, protections on, on their borders uh, and, and tariffs, importing and exporting is becoming harder. That's exactly what uh, Trump is, is trying to do, keep the jobs home, not export the jobs out and, uh, uh, you know, renegotiate all of these trading deals. And every time that has happened in the 20th century and now in the 21st century, especially for the U.S., there is a 100 percent recession within 12 months. That's 13 out of 13 times that it happened uh, where global trade has peaked for a few years. There was a recession exactly one well, well within a year of it, especially on a, a inauguration year when there's a new president coming on there's so much uncertainty and you got to think all of these companies that are uh, multinational they're they don't know what's going on there might be new laws coming in so they don't know whether to hire uh, and expand or to fire so they're halting everything and that's why global trade is diminishing um and that's an that's an important question and, and i'm glad you asked it because the bottom line of this is that it, it, this is very uh, deflationary for the entire global economy, which means you're going to see pockets of inflation national uh, in, in on a national level. Meaning, for instance, the U.S. has been the exporter of one commodity for the past 46 years. It's called the U.S. dollar. It's been exporting it and importing tangible goods. That's that, that's the game, and now they're they're they can't do it anymore. So, well, they're going to do it to a lesser extent, and and what you're going to see is these dollars that have been, uh, f you know, <laughs> handled by foreign countries for 46 years. You're going to see them start flooding back into the United States banking system, and that's very inflationary. And you can't export them out uh, again because the countries don't want them. They want to be more nationalistic. That's an important thing, and that might make inflation uh, higher. Right now, inflation is at 2.5%. And it, it the last three months, it's gone up month over month at record pace, uh, almost 0.6% in January, which is huge. And uh, it, it, this is becoming a problem. It's becoming a huge problem. You, you mentioned dollars coming back to the U.S. because of what is happening with the global economy. As these dollars come back to the U.S., are they going to be placed into the U.S. economy where we're going to see more dollars in the economy? Is, is that what you're saying? Is that why we're going to see the devaluation? Actually, inflation is the devaluation of the dollar. Is that why we're going to see more inflation coming? First of all, China and Japan are both basically playing with with the U.S. economy as much as they want because they're the largest creditors. So you know nobody talks about this, Dave. But if if China buys a 30-year bond or a two-year bond, that's an important thing to know. And they're dumping their long-term 30-year bonds. They're then switching to two-year bonds. They're basically controlling the flows of money much uh, much more because they're telling the U.S. Uh, the U.S. government, look, we're willing to borrow for two years, to loan you money for two years now, not for 30. We're, we're, we're playing with you. They, uh, the U.S. economy is becoming a slave to these creditors, uh, especially to China and Japan. And, and they're starting to dump, to sell, because they want to make their own currencies, especially China, make their currencies uh, stabler, much, much more stable. That's why they're buying a lot of, uh, of gold in China and, and in Russia. They're trying to ally and make their uh, currencies more relevant for global trade than the U.S. dollar. Now, 
when those uh, when those funds come to the U.S., they go into the commercial banks. When the commercial banks get them, um, you, you got to realize if the, if the if the interest rates are low, the banks have no reason to loan them out. They're not in a in a rush. They have excess cash, and that's what's going on with the large banks today in the U.S. system. They have excess reserves that are at record highs. They're starting to give money back to, to, to the Federal Reserve, it, this, you know, extinguish these these funds, these access um, funds, because uh, this is detrimental to their to their uh, uh, business model. That's why the Fed is raising the rates right now, because they want the banks to start lending so that, you know, uh, inflation would pick up in the economy. People will start borrowing again, spending again. Things will move like they want. These banks, they live off of debt. They want the entire economy to be in, you know, to owe them. And for the past few years, uh, only corporations have been borrowing money. And, you know, when you can borrow money at such cheap rates, what companies have done in the stock market, especially these broad, uh, you know, these broad indices like the S&P 500, the Dow and the NASDAQ, they've been buying their own shares back. So when companies buy their own shares back, you see all of these great profits. But these are synthetic profits, right? Because th- th- these are not generated by actual company, uh, uh, you know, companies becoming better. It's generated because they borrow funds at zero rates and they bought their own shares back from the public. And now it looks like every share has more profit on it. This is unsustainable. This has caused the, the S&P 500 to be at a P.E. ratio of 27 today. That has not been uh, as high only in the dot-com bubble. And I'm going back to the 1890s. I'm going back 130 years. It has not been this high. It, it would now take you 27 years if, if uh, you want to buy a, a, the S&P 500 and make all of it a private company. The, the, the price you pay for it would take you 27 years of profit to get back your money. That's, an, that's a very... Uh, lousy investment. The the broad stock markets are very very expensive. Anyways, corporations will not be able to to keep borrowing when the Fed raises rate, raises rates. But the millennials that are feeling much more comfortable right now with the Trump in in in, uh, in office, they might start lending again for starting up businesses for. Um, getting into uh, to to uh, to the first homes, you know, taking on their first mortgages. They're starting to you know to forget about 2008, and that's scary. That's that that is to me the scariest part of this. It looks like uh, you know people have forgotten that nothing has changed, nothing fundamentally has changed. Uh, you know, if you listen to all of these congressional debates in 2008 and all of the things that they asked the banks to change, to simplify their models, to not have 3,000, 4,000 subsidiaries and LLCs and offshore accounts, nothing has been done. And so it's very scary to know that an entire generation is starting to forget about this, feel more comfortable, they're gonna borrow again, and this all starts to feel very familiar at at the worst time because, um, you know, for for like eight years, these people have been scared of the of the stock market, and they've not been suckered into it uh, to play with with the companies that they know nothing about. And now it seems like they're feeling much more comfortable. This it's it's a scary it's a scary time. So you mentioned the stock market with uh, individuals feeling hope. They're feeling, you know, like things are getting better. And lately what we've been seeing is that companies, like you said, they're they're not buying as much of their own stock anymore. That's slowing up right now. We also see the smart money in the market. They are selling their shares and they're selling it to retailers. Is this a classic bubble type of situation? Do, do you see a classic bubble happening in the market? Not yet. And that's the scary part. There's so much cash sitting on the sidelines that have that has not participated in this rally that we had in the last eight years. It's mostly been institutional money, and it's mostly been hedge funds. And here's here's the thing, Dave. In 1980, when the last bull market began, it took two and a half weeks for the average American worker to accumulate a salary and buy a share of the Dow. 
Today, it takes 27 weeks. The stock market, which you and I and the labor, toil, sweat, 